as I've been journeying in this revelation, I, I, I've just seen everything through different eyes. You know, God's love being poured into my heart. Just it brings a totally different perspective, and not just about God, but the Bible and the Bible and spirituality. But it actually brings a, a new perspective to the whole of life. And I, I finally, after years of Sue put in her flyer of sex and drugs and rock and roll and being a pastor, I finally discovered what life is. Not not just Christianity, not Christian life, but what what life is really all about. And and I believe this is the core of having a good life, having a successful life, having an enjoyable life. God is my father and he loves me and wants me to know him. And I'm experiencing that. I know this to be real because, not because Jesus died on the cross for me and I've I've adopted some kind of abstract doctrine or theology, but it's because I'm experiencing this love constantly, consistently outpouring into my life. And during this time of the pandemic, I've been really surprised at how content I've been in the situation of not being able to go anywhere, not being able to go and see live music or um, go out for a meal or anything like that. You know, I'm not panicking. I've not had a meltdown. And I've been sitting since, I think the last conference I did was in January. So I've been sitting since January with no income, no prospect of paid work, and I'm not freaking out. I've discovered a, a calmness within, and I realize it's because love is shielding me. Love is sustaining me. And it's not all rosy. Obviously, I have my moments. But it's a conscious turning to love whenever my heart feels troubled or anxious. And that's, that's what sustained me. Reminding myself that I am loved, I'm significant, I'm precious. And just resting in that. I really believe that that's the experience that underpins much of the New Testament writings. You know, when men and, and if you believe some women wrote the New Testament, they, they were living in this reality and they wrote from that perspective. It's why they could write as they did during hardship, during persecution, because they knew this love, they knew whose they were and who held them. And I just wonder if, if we've somehow missed all of that and and that's why we've had to formulate our religious systems and rules to try and fill the gap of our knowledge and experience. I've been reading Paul's letters recently, especially Ephesians, and it's, it's just been an amazing unfolding of love. And I'd never previously considered that the epistles spoke so much about Father. I always saw the, the, the letters of the apostles as addressing issues and problems and, and telling us how to follow Jesus. But as I've been reading Paul's letters again, I realized that he speaks actually quite a bit about the Father. And I, I'm convinced that Paul saw our relationship with the Father as fundamental to being a believer. I mean, when you, when you look at his various letters to churches and individuals, you know, he, he starts off by bringing greetings and every one of them makes reference to Father. Not just Jesus. You know, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, in Ephesians, in Philippians, 2 Thessalonians, Philemon, this is what Paul greets his, his readers with. Grace and peace to you from, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. He doesn't even mention Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians, he said, To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. In his letters to Timothy, he speaks about grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. And again in Titus, he says the same, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. And despite a lot of what I've heard people say, Paul sees the Father and Jesus as having distinct identities separate from one another. And I never really saw that in the past, that I guess the emphasis on Jesus kind of blinded me to the reality of what Paul was saying about the Father of Jesus, not just Jesus himself. I've become convinced that, as I've been reading these letters, that it's, it's more important to pay special attention to the parts of Paul's letters where he actually talks about the Father. 
unless we understand that, unless we we grasp Paul's um, pers- uh, perspective of God without seeing Paul's theology through the lens of his view of the Father, I don't think we can really fully understand Paul's theology in the rest of his writings. You know, God as Father is a significant part of Paul's understanding about the nature of God and, and who he is. And as I've been reading this, I realise that the little comments he makes, the sentences that are sprinkled throughout his letters have become very significant for me as I am trying to go deeper in knowing God and experiencing him. When Paul speaks about the Father, he, he's revealing something of God's character, God's attitude to humanity, even in just the little short statements that he makes. And unless, unless we have this understanding, I, I really think we, we miss who Paul is saying God is. Unless we understand that he sees Father as the foundation of, of, of a believer's life, we will miss what he's saying when he just references God. When he's saying God, he's saying Father. And what happens is that we start to revert to unflattering theological ideas and pictures of who God is that don't actually reflect who Father is. And I think one of the things that, that we see in Paul as he speaks about God the Father and his relationship with, with his son, Jesus, we, we get a, a bigger picture of, of the nature of Jesus' relationships, uh, relationship sorry, to Abba while he was walking in the earth. What Paul is doing in, in, in his writings, he expands the gospel's descriptions of what it looked like when Jesus walked with the Father. And Paul is expanding that when he, he begins to speak about God the Father and Jesus and all of his letters. But I believe the most significant fact that we need to take into consideration when we're looking at Paul's theology and, and what he thinks about God, his perspective of God as a father, is to understand that Paul says he received the revelation of the gospel, the gospel that he teaches, that he writes about, that he preaches, he said he received it directly from Jesus himself. He tells us in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, all of these people who say, Paul, the gospel Paul preaches is, is so distant from from jesus it's actually a different gospel but actually paul is saying no i was i was i received this by revelation from jesus himself you know he talks about being out in the arabian desert for three years he says in second corinthians 12 that he and we think he's speaking about himself in this when he says i know a man in christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven whether it was in the body or out of the body i don't know god knows and I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, he was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, even things that man is not permitted to tell. And so as we read the Paul's tales or Paul's letters, Paul's lectures, whatever, however you perceive them, he's saying, this is what Jesus gave me. This is... Everything I write is founded upon the revelation that Jesus gave me. Now, Jesus spoke about Father around 200 times in the Gospels. And I think if that was such an important factor in the Gospel for Jesus, then he must have taught Paul something about his walk with the Father. In fact, Paul saw Father as the origin of all things. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, For us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. I think that's an incredible statement, just that little bit at the end. Not everyone knows this. I think that, that that could be a real indictment upon the preaching of God that we've put forth in, in years gone past. 
where we've misrepresented him as angry and vengeful. And Paul is saying, but God is the Father. And it's from him, everything came. And actually, he's the one we live for. When I first read that, that was a real shock to me that I live for Father, not for Jesus. You know, the, the brand of Christianity that I was became a believer in and, and walked in for a long, a long time, it was all about burning out for Jesus. But the Bible never tells me to do that. And Paul takes what he learned from Jesus and begins to apply that to everything he writes. And he sees Father as the underpinning of everything. You know, throughout his ministry, Jesus wanted people to see his Father, to understand who he really is. And, and this is what Paul reflects. He reflects it in the prayers that he prays, in Ephesians and, and uh, Romans and Colossians. He's following a narrative that Jesus gave him. And he understood that this revelation of the Father is the true gospel. His teaching and preaching <laughs> focused on Jesus coming into this world to show us what God is really like and help us understand that the cross is the deepest expression of the Father's love for humanity. That to help us understand the cross was never intended by God to be an instrument of torture and punishment where Jesus stood in our place. It was sin that was punished, not Jesus. It was sin that was dealt with, not humanity. And so if Paul is speaking about his let in his letters of God the Father, I guess it must be an important matter for Paul as much as it was for Jesus. 42 times in his 13 letters, Paul speaks of God the Father. In Romans 8, 15, he's, he says that by the Spirit we call Father Abba. And it's interesting because the only other person in the Bible recorded using that word is Jesus. Another indication that, that Paul's gospel is something he received from the Lord himself. And when, he's, when he speaks about us calling God Abba, he's, I believe he's referencing our sonship. You know, the word Paul uses for sonship is heothesia. No one in the Bible, apart from Paul, used this word heothesia. Getting my tongue tied up. In Greek literature, literature it's not used, not in sacred or, or secular writings. You see, Paul made this word up. Because the Greek language of adoption did not fit Paul's picture of what it meant to be God's sons and daughters. And so he made a word up to describe a unique situation where human beings who are God's offspring receive from God an inheritance as natural biological children. You see, Paul recognizes that our humanity is actually rooted in the love of a father for us. The word adoption doesn't cover it. I can't go into it all here, but I recommend if you get a hold of Trevor Galpin's teaching on, on this, it's very good. In Ephesians, Paul prays for the church in chapter 1. He says in verse 15, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Some translations say so that you might know him as he really is. Paul goes on and says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I love, I mean, twice there Paul talk, speaks about glory, glorious father and glorious inheritance. And this is how Paul sees the God of Jesus Christ as a glorious father. And he tells us in Romans chapter 6 that it's through the Father's glory we live this new life. In Romans 6 verse 4. And I find it really interesting Paul's praying for the Ephesian saints for a direct revelation from the glorious father so that we can know him better. 
And he's writing this to Christians, to believers. And he's saying, you have so much still to learn. You have so much more to experience of him. And I pray that you would get a revelation of this and you would get the wisdom to know how to step into that place of, ex of experiencing him as he really is. Not as he's been taught, not as he's been pictured, but as he is. And he tells us in Romans 15, it, it's kind of ref a reflection of that again. May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we've taken the blessings of God, the blessings of, of a father for his children, and it's, we've appropriated them as individual blessings. And individuals do share in these blessings, they experience them individually, but as we look at Paul, there's a constant thread of Paul speaking about unity, about body, about together with the saints, that one uh, homogenous, not homogenous, but one group, one family. And he's saying this is where the fullness of these blessings are realized, in community and in relationship. Yes, you experience it as an individual, but you experience it most fully as part of a group, as part of a family. Whatever that looks like, whether it's in, in someone's home, whether it's just with a group of friends who are all believers, it doesn't necessarily mean going to church services. But he's speaking about a community, and that's why he says the glorious inheritance in all the saints. Paul speaks of Father as our comforter in 2 Corinthians 1.3 and 2 Thessalonians 2.16 as well. He, he speaks about praise being given to the Father in 2 Corinthians 11 and in Philippians 2 and Philippians 4. And he tells us that through Christ we have access to Father. He tells us that in Ephesians 2.18. We don't have access to angels or to heaven or to blessings or to power. He's saying through Christ you have access to the Father. The purpose of the gospel, the purpose of Jesus coming. And Paul develops that a little bit more in 2 Corinthians 5 when he talks about his ministry. He tells us what his ministry is. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You know, we don't judge people according to how well they're dressed or how well they speak or, or how poor they are or how rich they are or how blessed they are. We don't, that's not how we judge people. You know, we may once have judged Christ that way, but we do so no longer, Paul says. He's saying, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In other words, we, we see things differently. We understand things differently. We no longer are eating the fruit from the, that tree that taught us how to judge one another. And this new that's coming, this old that's going, it's something continuous. It's not a one-off wave of God's magic wand. We are in the process of becoming more and more the new creations that he designed us to be. And he tells us that this reconciliation, this new way of seeing, this new way of being, all of this is from God, who Paul calls Father. From God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And th this is the message that Paul says he preached. God, that's the Father, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal to us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And again, this is incredible. Paul is writing this to believers and he's saying you still need to be reconciled to the Father. He's speaking about, I believe he's speaking about a return to the primary relationship of the garden where the man and woman knew themselves as sons and daughters. You know, God is the instigator of Jesus coming to earth and was in Christ or through Christ was bringing the world back to himself. That's what reconciliation is, isn't it? It's bringing something back together that has been separated. 
And it's interesting, he's bringing the world back to himself, not to Jesus, not to church, but to himself. And I love the fact that Paul says he could do this because God was not holding our sins against us. He said, whatever barrier there was between you and God, God wasn't holding that barrier in place. You were. You see, that's the wonderful truth. God was never angry with us. That's what Jesus came to show us by his life, by his ministry, by his death. What Jesus did was to destroy sin and its power by taking sin and the law to the grave. Colossians tells us that, Romans tells us that. You see, the gap that we experienced between us as human beings and God wasn't because God was annoyed. It was because mankind was resistant to his love. What happened in the garden when mankind ate the fruit wasn't that they sinned and offended God, but they separated themselves from love's guiding and began to do what was right in our own eyes. And what Paul is saying and what Jesus came to show us is that love has always been there. We don't need to be afraid of love. We don't need to separate ourselves from love. But if we come back into love's embrace, we begin to see things differently. We begin to live differently. We begin to know the guidance of love and life's choices and and decisions and life's troubles and hardships. We know the calming presence of love. You see, this was the gospel that Paul preached. This is what he taught the churches that he planted. And I used to wonder why is the revelation of the Father not more clearly spelled out in the Gospels and the letters of the Apostles? And, and I realized as I was reading these letters that the reason that I hadn't seen it spelled out more explicitly than it is, Paul had planted and nurtured these churches. He had poured his life into them, his teaching into them for some of them up to three years. They knew where he was coming from. He didn't have to spell it out to them. You see, Paul wasn't writing a treatise that he knew would be read 2,000 years later. He was just writing to a group of people who needed some guidance. And they knew that he saw the Father's love as a foundation of Christian living. And so when he referenced the Father, they knew exactly what he was meaning, what he was speaking about. So he didn't need to spell it out for them. And if we can see between the gospel and Jesus, the teaching comes together. God is our Father. He loves us. He's always loved us. And so when he became a man and came into this world, it wasn't because he was angry with us. It was because he wanted to show love to us in a way that we could understand and embrace. This is a vastly different version of the gospel to most of the sermons that I've heard uh, over my life as a Christian. I mean, to understand God has nothing against you. You know, I'd always been told God was opposed to me because I'm a sinner. But actually, I, this may be controversial, but I don't like using that word of people because I don't believe it's true of people. What we describe as sinners are people disconnected from love. And they're trying to find a way through life without love's guidance. And so the gospel message is return to love and love will guide you through life. Not just through Christianity, not through church, not through theology. Love will guide you through life. Paul says that we're not sinners because God was not holding anything against us. And when we really understand that, there's no longer any need to hide when we feel as though we've messed up. When we understand that, there's no need to 
get on our knees and beat our breasts and weep and cry out as we've been taught how to repent. There's no need for any of that. It's a coming back to the embrace of love and acknowledging, I can't do this alone, the Father. I need you. You know, as I've been saying through this pandemic, that's been my constant. Father, I can't do this without you. I make mistakes, I, I trip up, I fall over, I get it wrong. And I come back into the arms of love and say, Dad, I can't do this alone. Show me how to navigate this. Show me how to, to walk through this lockdown, through this no work, through this no income. Show me how to navigate this. In my heart, in my relationships, in, my, in the way I speak, in the way I act, the way I behave. Let me be at peace. You see, we talk about love casting out fear. The whole picture of repentance I was given was, was a picture of fear. I have to weep and cry and I have to prove to God I'm sorry. But that's not the picture that Jesus gives us. It's not the picture actually that Paul paints for us either. The picture is come back into the arms of love. That's, that's repentance. Return to love. And you don't have to beat your breast. You don't have to weep and cry and, and bawl and, and hide in darkness until you feel God's accepted you again. He never crosses his arms. He ne his arms are always open wide to love. You, to love me. And when we begin to understand that this is how God is, this is how he sees us, Everything changes. It's impossible to, even when God is saying, that's not a good thing for you to be doing. It's not a, he's not shouting, he's just saying, son, that's not helpful. That's not healthy. And I, I don't feel as though I've been beaten over the head with a big stick. I feel loved. Even when I'm told this isn't helpful, I feel loved. <laughs> when I grew up, I didn't feel loved when I was getting in, into trouble for doing something wrong <laughs> because I did get beat. I was beaten for getting it wrong, for doing things wrong, for messing up, for falling over, for making a mistake. And this is so different, this love of the Father that says, let me show you a different way. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't he? At the end of, of chapter 12, he says, let me show you a different way, a higher way. And then he goes on to speak all about the qualities of love. Have a read of 1 Corinthians 13 with the perspective, not that Paul is saying you have to do this to be loving, but from the perspective that this is who God is, this is how he loves you, and this is what his love will do in you. When we, when we begin to see that different perspective, it changes completely the way we see God, the way we see one another, we, the way we see life. And it's far healthier and happier. You know, in fact, talking about the pandemic and feeling this love comforting me, I've actually been losing weight. Everyone's complaining about the weight they've put on. I've actually been losing weight because... I'm in a place where I can just look after myself and not, I'm not stress eating, which is, was always a big issue for me, stress eating. When I stopped running, I put on 10 kilos, well more, probably about 13 kilos. And that stayed there because of stress eating. But during this pandemic, when I should be stressed, <laughs> I'm not. I'm losing weight. And I'm not, I'm not on some special diet. I'm just looking after myself. Because I know I'm loved. And I know that love is, is comforting my heart. You know, Paul tells us that he's the God of all comfort, the Father of compassion. 
He sees my situation. He sees that this is a situation where I could easily become stressed. I could easily panic. I could easily overeat or, or drink too much wine or whatever. Well, whiskey. But wine sounds much more Christian, doesn't it? <laughs> but, you know, I could easily do all of those things. But love is showing me how to live without giving into that stress, that fear, that negativity, that pain. And as I say, I have my moments where I just keep turning towards his love and know myself, as David said, like a baby in his mother's breast, just sated and satisfied and comforted. That's our Papa. That's Abba. And I see as I read through Paul's letters, this is who he's presenting us with. I see beyond the, the English translations, if I may say that, and how that's presenting God to, to who Jesus said he is and who Paul learned he is from Jesus. And it just has transformed the scriptures for me. I can see more probably, but I'll stop there and I'll hand back to Sue.